Hello and welcome to this episode of Smarter, a podcast by clinicians for clinicians brought to you by Marta, an Australian leader in healthcare for more than a century. My name's Gillian Whiting. And I'm Bronwyn Jennings, gynaecology, oncology, clinical nurse consultant at Marta Hospital Brisbane. And we're coming to you from Mianjin, the land on which this podcast is being recorded. Today, we are joined by Dr. Catherine Shannon, Senior Medical Oncologist at Marta Cancer Care Centre. Catherine is the Director of Medical Oncology Clinical Trials Unit and a Principal or Co-Investigator on a number of clinical trials in gynaecological, breast and early phase cancer treatment. She's also a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland on the Ovarian Cancer Working Group for ANSCOG, past executive committee member for the Medical Oncology Group of Australia and the Medical Oncology Consultant for the National Breast and Ovarian Cancer Centre. Today, she's joining us to talk about cervical cancer and the advances, the challenges and the new therapies now available. We are Marta. We are Marta. We are Marta. This is Smarter. Broadly speaking, what's the current state of play for cervical cancer in Australia? Well, there have been lots of changes over probably the last decade. We've had changes in the screening program. We've had changes in the rollout of the um, vaccination program. And there's changes in the new treatments that have been available. So it's quite an exciting time for cervical cancer. And I guess now we're on the big push um, to eradicate. And I think Australia is ahead of the curve with that. So that puts us globally in a very, you know, unique position um, to try and, uh, you know, do better in this particular cancer. What are current statistics? So about 44 to 66 per 100,000 women. I guess one of the things to think about is that there are certain vulnerable populations um, that have a slightly higher rate. So if we think about um, our Indigenous population, their rates are slightly higher. Um, If we think about our refugee population, um, their rates are slightly higher. So there are some pockets of our community where, you know, we're still facing some um, challenges unique to those populations. So, Kath, it is a good news story that um, rates of cervical cancer are decreasing thanks to the national vaccination programs and also the national screening programs. What has this meant for you as a medical oncologist in terms of treating these people? Um, I guess overall it's meant that I've seen fewer patients. Um, It would always be nice to see none. Um, I've always dreamt of redundancy, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, So, I mean, I guess, you know, we're seeing fewer fewer of them than we would have seen 10 or 20 years ago um, when I first started um, here. Um, But sadly, we do still see women coming with um, uh, cervical cancer and um, we do now have more treatments for advanced disease. Um, We still do see some of those women although obviously the rates are falling. Looking at the process now, so a patient is diagnosed with cervical cancer, what factors do you look at to determine treatments and the next steps? So some of the factors are around the tumour itself and some of the factors are around the patient. So obviously um, the best treatment for modality for an individual is going to depend on um, the size of their of their cancer, how far it's spread, if it's spread beyond the cervix, uh, and also patient factors, you know, how old someone is, their other sicknesses and comorbidities, um, things like that. So I guess there's a vast team of people um, that get together and assess all those factors to determine sort of the best course of um, treatment for a particular individual. So traditionally a patient diagnosed with an advanced cervical cancer would have been prescribed or recommended for chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Why is that the case? Um, So the cervix is uniquely positioned in the pelvis. If the tumour is too large or if it's spread to the lymph nodes on the side of the pelvis, you can't really do an operation that gets around it all with a safe margin. So in those circumstances, it's better for us to use uh, radiotherapy as the primary modality. And we discovered in the late 1990s that if we add a little bit of chemotherapy every week, we actually sensitise the cancer cells to the radiation so we get better response rates in the long term. And has that been a successful treatment? Yes, yeah. So that was the first um, National Cancer Institute alert to the world was that adding chemotherapy to radiation for cervical cancer um, improved long-term outcomes in locally advanced disease. So um, that was quite a, sort of a light bulb moment. Um, there have been a couple since then in more advanced disease and there's still changes that we're making along the way. Like therapies, testing is continuing to evolve 
Australia introduced a renewed national cancer screen program in 2017 that included a change from two yearly pap smear tests for the target age group of 20 to 69 years to five yearly HPV tests. If cancer causing HPV is found, a liquid-based cytology or LBC test is recommended for those aged 25 to 74. There have been some recent advances in, in treatment options for cervical cancer, uh, mainly around immunotherapy. Can you talk to us about what they are? So I guess over the last couple of decades, there have been a few sort of um, improvements in terms of treatment of metastatic cervical cancer. The first of those was probably adding in the bevacizumab um, to the chemotherapy, which stops tumours making their own blood vessels. The second, um, which received PBS approval last year, was the addition of pembrolizumab, which is an immunotherapy um, to augment people's response um, to the treatment when they've got metastatic disease. So how does pembrolizumab work? So basically um, the idea of immunotherapy is to essentially take the brakes off the body's own immune system so that the own, their own immune system is activated to attack their cancer, uh, if you like. Um, so that's been successful in cervical cancer, melanoma and lung cancer. We're probably the leaders in it. We're probably a little bit later to the party, um, but certainly now it would be standard of care for women to receive um, immunotherapy with their chemotherapy first line for their metastatic cervical cancer. So how often would you adopt that approach at, at MARTA and what have the response rates been like? So we did the um, initial clinical trials, which were a worldwide rollout, um, massive effort um, internationally. And certainly we had some women locally on those trials um, showing that there was an improved response if you combine the immunotherapy with their chemotherapy. Obviously, we've moved on now and that's um, more widely available through the PBS, um, which is a great um, achievement that we came to in the middle of last year. Um, we would probably have about between 12 and 20 women a year who needed this sort of treatment. Um, and that's, you know, if we look at the national numbers, there's about 250 um, metastatic cervical cancers diagnosed per year in Australia. Um, so, you know, we're treating a proportion of those, a proportion of those largely from Queensland. Um, but, um, you know, it has been a major advance for them. And the idea there is that if you can get a better response, you can then pull out the chemotherapy and use the immunotherapy to maintain that response over time. So if you look back historically, the median survival for these women was about 12 months, but, you know, we're looking to push it out um, way beyond that, you know, beyond that two-year mark. You briefly mentioned the recent PBS listing for pembrolizumab. In terms of getting therapeutic goods administration approvals and PBS approvals, what's the process involved? How do you get those things happening? So it does take a long time and it can be a bit frustrating for those of us on the cold face um, who've used these drugs in trial because from the point of release of the trial, it's usually about two years to be able to get it on the PBS. The TGA look at it a little bit earlier because they're not looking at um, the um, dollars and cents. Um, so you can get a TGA approval based on the results of a clinical trial within about sort of six months or so. And there is now a mechanism where by the TGA, FDA and the Canadian um, equivalent of the TGA um, have a consortium where they can all assess the same information and get a regulatory approval. Unfortunately, TGA regulatory approval in Australia doesn't actually pay for the treatment. You have to then get a PBS funding for someone to pay for the treatment, which is hideously expensive. Are there still side effects uh, with immunotherapy? So there are. They're quite different to chemotherapy, the immunotherapy side effects. So I think um, most people went into it thinking, oh, really, there's almost no side effects from immunotherapy. And certainly there are a proportion of people who don't get any. Um, but there are some not insignificant side effects like skin rashes, diarrhoea, uh, and some people can get um, problems with their thyroid function or their adrenal function. So there's a whole lot of monitoring that goes on in the background um, to make sure that people aren't having an immune reaction against their normal tissues, essentially. And, and how do those reactions compare to the, the chemo radiation route? Um, largely speaking, um, if you don't get one of the very significant ones, which fortunately are rare, sort of under the 10% mark, um, it's generally speaking better tolerated than either chemotherapy or radiation in terms of acute side effects. Doesn't have the nausea, doesn't have the intense fatigue, those sort of things. 
Australia is on a mission to eliminate cervical cancer by 2035, which could make Australia the first country in the world to actively achieve this goal. It's already on the right track. In 2020, Australia reported that 80.5% of girls were fully vaccinated by the age of 15. In addition to this, 67.3% of women aged 45 to 49 participated in cervical screening in 2018 to 2021, and 85.8% of those with pre-cancer identified in 2020 received treatment within six months. Kath, clinicians love to hear a case study. Can you give us an example of a patient you've provided treatment and care for um, in terms of their chemotherapy, radiation, and then the immunotherapy? Yeah, so, I mean, I think in the last six months we've had about eight ladies that we've given this combination of treatments. It's a long day um, and some people come from a long way away. So we've got people from um, rural and regional communities who have to come all the way if they don't have closer oncology centres so they will fly down, um, have that treatment. It takes about seven hours on that day so it's not especially quick. Um, obviously you want to get to the point where you've shrunk everything up and then you can take the chemotherapy components out and they can be on a maintenance treatment which doesn't have many side effects. So that's a sort of the, um, the pathway that you're headed for to get everything to shrink down nicely and then their symptoms get a lot better at that stage and then hopefully they can be on a maintenance therapy for a prolonged period of time. Catherine, how do you see uh, treatment options uh, advancing and evolving in, in the coming years? I mean, I think the first thing we would hope to see is fewer and fewer cases of more advanced um, cervical cancer. So, you know, we want that 250 or 240 nationally to, you know, um, come right down. So you'd be hoping that you weren't treating that many um, cases in a year. Um, and that will be with us working on, you know, elimination strategies such as vaccination and screening. Um, uh, and then, you know, other strategies that we're looking at. So how do we combine treatments to target these, um, these um, tumours? So, you know, there are new things coming down the pipeline, new combined immunotherapies which show an augmented response. Um, so there'll be, you know, the next thing and the next thing, like little building blocks to, you know, try and get us there. And, and building towards um, a dream date of 2035 elimination? Yes, that's, the, that's where Australia is a little ahead of the curve um, compared to some other countries um, uh, in that, you know, we are, are making strides in that elimination and I think probably most of the strides are being made in the prevention space, which obviously is wonderful. Um, you know, self-testing um, has opened up screening to a much broader range of pa patients. Self-testing has been really successful in some of those communities, such as Indigenous communities or refugee communities where there have been barriers to more conventional, um, you know, uh, HPV testing. So I think there have been some really big gains you know, as women, it's nice for us not to have to get a pap smear every two years. Pushing it out to five has been a revolution for most of us. Um, so I think they're where we're making um, real inroads. It's extraordinary. Mm, it is really fantastic. So a lot of these advances wouldn't have been possible without research. And you talked a little while ago about some of the studies that marta has been involved with. Can you expand on them at all? So over the years, we've always tried to, you know, have a broad range of clinical trials available for women so that I guess at any kind of crossroads um, where their disease might be progressing, they've got multiple different options. So, um, you know, we always have a range of clinical trials where we can. Um, some of those might be in early cervical cancer. We've done trials um, that were led nationally called the Outback Study, looking at adding more chemotherapy uh, into treatment of locally advanced cervical cancer. As I said, we did the registration study for the pembrolizumab. Um, we're now looking at antibody drug conjugates, which are probably coming very quickly into sort of second line treatment for cervical cancer and how we can access those. So clinical trials, um, you know, for all the good science are in practical terms a way of accessing the new treatments for the patients much earlier than we're going to be able to access them in a commercial sense. So you briefly mentioned antibody drug conjugates. Can you explain to us what they are and how they work? They're a relatively new offering in terms of treatments. Yeah, so this is a really big space at the moment um, is these, you know, they originally 
were termed smart bomb treatments. Um, the first of them was uh, introduced in um, breast cancer, so HER2 positive breast cancer with TDM1. But now there's a whole raft of them um, coming along where there's an antibody attached with a special linker to a special, you know, cytotoxic payload. So the antibody can hook onto the tumour cell preferentially and put the payload straight into the, um, the tumour cells. So we're doing... Um, a raft of clinical trials in ovarian cancer with them. There's some out there for cervical cancer that we're bringing through uh, and breast cancer's probably led the way at this stage and there are some in commercial use in the breast cancer space now. So before we go, we'd like to introduce you to a little segment that we call The Checkup. And this is about uh, learning a little bit more about Catherine, the medical professional, of course, Catherine, the person as well. So uh, Robin's going to ask you five quick questions. Uh, they're not tricky. <laughs> you ready to go? Go. Okay. So the first question, if you weren't a medical oncologist, what would you be doing? I'd be an architect. I put absolutely no skill in drawing or aesthetics, but I always thought it would be really cool to be an architect. How do you want patients to see you? I guess as caring, empathetic, you know, someone that, um, that they can feel that they can trust. I think one of the most important things is people feeling like they've been heard, mm. um, that, you know, their interaction with you, their concerns have been heard. What TV show best portrays your profession? I have been binge watching New Amsterdam. The, uh, the lead guy in New Amsterdam has throat cancer. So I've been identifying where they've clearly got no idea what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. If you had to invite three guests to dinner, who would they be? My dad would be the top of the list because he's uh, a great conversationalist and whoever else was there, he could entertain us all in a great range of topics. Um, always thought it would be really cool to sit down with Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. So I guess notwithstanding the fact that he's in heaven, but, um, you know, in terms of his life experiences. I think the third person would be um, one of the oncologists from Sydney, a lady called Fran Boyle, who's quite famous in the breast cancer space in yeah. Australia-wide. Yeah. Um, and she's into archery as her pastime. So I think that's an interesting idea. It is indeed. And then the final question, if you had to impart one piece of knowledge on a medical student, what would it be? I think it would be... When that patient leaves, you want them to feel like they've had a positive experience with you, mm. even if it hasn't necessarily been all positive news. Fantastic. Thank you. Great advice. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, thanks so much for joining us on Smarter. Thank you very much, Gillian. Now, for our listeners at home or in the car or having a well-deserved break between patients, thank you for tuning in. Join us for our next episode where we continue exploring women's health. See you next time on Smarter.